always thought I had something I had to give back because I always felt I had a mission. I love teaching. I love teaching residents and medical students. I like uh, sharing my passion for what I do with other people and encouraging the next generation uh, to pursue this as a field. I think the multifaceted aspects of academic medicine were what drew me in. It's a fun and invigorating and exciting place to be because uh, there's always a lot of new discovery going on in all aspects and you're a part of that acquisition of new knowledge. It's gonna push our field forward. If you wanna have a say on what is gonna happen, uh, well, you have to roll up your sleeves and help the work that is involving making it happen. I get to do something different every day. I uh, have a basic science lab, I do research, I'm the student clerkship director. I have an opportunity to interact with smart, interested students and residents all the time. I'm not encumbered by a lot of the things that I would be if I was in the private sector. I don't uh, ever question my judgments uh, based on whether I'm doing it for uh, other reasons than this is the correct thing to do. I chose academic surgery because I saw it as always having a challenge. The idea that I could be driving to work and come up with a new idea and actually take that to the laboratory and act upon it is very appealing. When I chose a career in surgery, I have been exposed to this environment where surgeons not only operate on patients and take care of their problems and, and help them get better, but are also contributing uh, by doing research uh, and advancing the field and coming up with the next big breakthrough, whether it's uh, laboratory-based or uh, clinical outcomes research or uh, technology research. That component adds uh, tremendous excitement and adds a, a sense of uh, giving back and, and maybe advancing the field. I think it's very important to try to incorporate the scientific part of your career into your clinical part. If we just work on what's known in the past, we're going to continue to make mistakes. What was true 10, 15 years ago may or may not be true today because medicine's changed. So years ago we said asymptomatic carotid disease was best treated by surgery above a certain degree of stenosis. That may or may not be true today because the best medical treatment then was just aspirin. Today we have Plavix, we have statins, there are other medications. So accepting science from the past doesn't necessarily make sense. You need to continue advancing science and incorporating the science into your day-to-day -day life. I saw that there was an opportunity on the technical and mechanical side of surgery to reinvent myself, hopefully change the field, help reinvent or redefine the field. Surgeons have had a long track record of being innovators. They've had a long track record of being ahead of the curve with regard to novel investigations. I remember in my training, uh, the list of Nobel Prize winners uh, was sort of presented to us. And it was astounding the number of surgeons who had actually been uh, at the forefront of, of earth-shattering novel discovery. If instead of looking at a problem and saying, yeah, this is a bad problem, we don't know how to deal with it, and throwing up our hands, a surgical scientist can say, here's a small question I can ask. Does the location, the length of the incision, does the way I make the incision influence the outcome? We can start scientifically asking the question, how can we take a bad problem today and make it better tomorrow? An academic surgeon today, I think, is, is different. It's not just working in a laboratory with, uh, with basic research but it's also taking care of patients, being an educator, and also looking at the systems and how we can perform better, more efficiently, with higher quality. I think a surgeon scientist is someone who does exactly that, who tries to further the field of, of surgery and medicine. And I think that you can do that for many ways. You can do that in the lab, benchtop research. You can do it with clinical research and outcomes type research. And I think also education makes someone a surgical scientist, because I think the ability to train others to do what we do is probably the most important job we do in academic medicine because hey, we don't want to stop with us. I think you need to chain the next generation of physicians and surgeons. One of the um, 
avenues that surgery provided me, which I did not anticipate when I first started my career, was the opportunity to get more involved with professional societies. And those are the types of avenues where you can create change on a larger scale. The role of the surgical societies to me is a, uh, it's a, it's a network, uh, a little bit of a social and uh, um, uh, collegial network where you get to uh, meet new people, uh, express some new ideas, and also it's a chance to catch up with old faces that have gone different ways. By going to meetings and getting involved in societies, you get to see a bigger picture of what's going on with surgery uh, as a whole. And it's a way to make sure that you're providing the same quality of care to your patients that's being offered at other institutions. I found the first time that I went to a meeting as a resident uh, that uh, it just opens your eyes. You see uh, all of these ideas being put forth, many similar to what you've done uh, in your own work, and, and you jot down 20 different uh, notes about what you could do next and how you can advance uh, your own work. As a resident in training, I had an experience that was incredibly important for my advancement as a surgeon scientist. I received an award uh, based on some basic science research that I had conducted, and I was given the opportunity to present the data uh, from this award at the national meeting. So I was presenting to a group of fully trained surgeons. Talk about intimidating. <laughs> but this was such a great opportunity. And after that talk, there were so many people that would come up to me and talk to me about the research and how important it is to continue doing that research. And that really had an effect on my career. You know, a pat on the back goes a long way. And these meetings do a good job of that. And I think it's, uh, really a source of positive energy in sort of the, the training loop uh, of general surgery. I've had countless students tell me that at the annual meeting of the American College of Surgeons, they met a chairman in a department of surgery from some other institution who encouraged them to apply for residency to their program. And they ultimately went there as a result of initial contact. There's nothing like it. I know my career was affected tremendously by my interactions with uh, these type of environments and these type of academic uh, societies uh, to the point in which it could not have happened without it. So you feel a responsibility to give back uh, a lot of that very good uh, things that, that you received. Surgical societies have played a great role in my career in advancing the, the marriage of education and science in the last few years. I think the developments in our field uh, are fast changing, but that's one of the things that excited me about going into surgery and medicine in general. I think the, our ability to keep up with all the latest cutting edge trends, you have to come to meetings. Things that are presented at a meeting may not be published for another year, year and a half, and so it's a way to, to kind of get a head start on what's going to be coming out. The excitement of just hearing about some of these new things from the young people really is, is the, the engine that drives American surgery to the, to the top of all world surgery. When I come to one of these meetings, I am always re-energized and re-inspired. Um, I get new ideas and I people, see people who I know are very bright, very talented people who care about some of the same things and I can see them grappling with the same problems. So I go home always excited and eager to share some of those things with my colleagues, my residents, my students. When I was younger, I, uh, I wanted to be a teacher because some of the greatest uh, influences on my life were my teachers, as well as my father. And my father had said he wanted to be a teacher, so I wanted to be like Dad. And I said, well, maybe I can be a teacher. I uh, went into surgery and medicine by happenstance, and then I realized I could combine two of the greatest things that I love to do, medicine, surgery, and teaching. A surgeon educator is a, a mentor. She's hemodynamically stable, and she obviously has some soft tissue deformity. Orthopods are on their way. You're the trauma surgeon, and there's no pulses, so what's your next move? It's somebody who uh, understands uh, the value of uh, taking a young person uh, under his wing and uh, helping them to get to the next phase of their professional development. Because the reality is that the lifeblood of any profession uh, 
are the young people coming into that profession. And if you can't promulgate that, if you can't encourage young people to come along, uh, the specialty is, uh, is going to wither no matter what the profession is. I teach every day. I started teaching when I was an intern my very first day in surgical training because I had medical students there with me. And even when I was in medical school, I was tutoring the medical students below me. And it works that way all through your life as a surgeon. And you know, as a junior attending faculty member, you'll be teaching the residents. And you'll still be learning from the senior surgeons above you. And when you become a senior surgeon, you'll be mentoring junior faculty and teaching residents. And it's a fundamental thread that ties us all together. And, and it not only helps us learn from each other, but it also ties us together as a community of surgeons. We don't stand in front of a classroom and lecture to a bunch of surgical residents. It's standing across the OR table uh, with a resident, letting them do what they're able to do, showing them what they're not able to do. If you do that, you'll have fewer ties fall off, and if fewer ties fall off, the operation goes better. Making suggestions, turn your needle this way, turn your wrist that way. What are you going to do if you cut that and it turned out to be a blood vessel and not something else? They're constantly asking me questions and keeping me on my toes. and making me um, stay on top of my game. Uh, and their energy is just very invigorating. The most important part about teaching is that it's to not only do what I say, but do what I do. My students and residents, they know well, when we make rounds, they may be long because we're gonna speak to everyone, we're gonna make sure that Ms. Johnson understands what her operation is gonna be. And then in the after surgery, we're gonna explain to her and her family uh, just what the problems are and that we're always going to be available. What excites me about education is that moment. And the moment is almost impossible to define or to describe in the end. It's where some concept, some task perhaps, that uh, an individual has been struggling with, it's a point of recognition or comprehension that you can see in that person's eyes. It's, it's wonderful. It's the best feeling in the entire world. Now that they have that piece of information, they'll be able to then go on and pass it on to tens, hundreds, maybe even thousands of other people. That's how we expand the love and care that is a part of medicine and particularly surgery. I think surgeons and educators are a little bit like farmers. We plant a crop, we recruit these young people that come to us, uh, we fertilize them, we water them, we take care of it, we hoe them, we weed them and all that kind of stuff. They grow, they develop, we improve their uh, work habits, their fund of knowledge, their technical yeah. skills, and then we harvest them. They graduate, they go on, they go back into the, uh, their communities. Pick them up July 1, six years ago, and some of them can't tie their shoes. And then five years later, they're a chief resident, and you know, you know in your heart you would let them operate on you if, if you needed it. It's, it's, it's powerful stuff, it's a lot of fun. I think I'll consider my career successful if there's a significant group of other surgeons that look fondly on you know, their experiences with me as far as uh, their training goes you know if they look back at me and say yeah you remember that old guy Steve Smith I want to be just like him in the operating room that would be the ultimate compliment to be able to take a resident through a case or an, and someday to see our legacy in those residents is the greatest success. So I think we're beginning to transition from, in residency, I was concerned about having my name on the paper, uh, and now I'm concerned about seeing my resident's name on the paper, and really I'm beginning to measure my success by their success. The thing I'm most proud of are the 250 or so men and women that I've trained under practicing surgery today. They're doing everything. We've got them in mission fields and barbaric places. We've got people in small towns. We've got a half a dozen people who are chairs of surgery, another half a dozen who are leading incredible research programs in America, as different as they can be. But they're really trying to do the best they can and excel and bring a sense of excellence to whatever they're doing. And I'm proud that we helped them get the skills to make that really work.